here. Good, Good to have, have all of you here. Be sure in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and well, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this morning hour that we're able to gather here and make a difference for the kingdom. God, we pray for each and every one that's here, that they'll have their Bibles open, be ready for the Word, be ready for the Word of truth, and that, Father, it will march on to victory, that we'll stand for Jesus Christ no matter what happens, no matter who gets in our way, and the devil we're not going to take any more. We're going to stand because we have the one standing with us and behind us and before us, God Almighty. Father, we're thankful for the blessings you give us each and every day, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul's writing this epistle, and he's in, he's in prison. He's under guard. And yet when you read this and when you get the fullness of these, you, you, you realize how Paul was encouraged. He was excited about what he was doing. And when we look at that very first part of that first book, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Two definite articles in the Greek are here. Paul didn't say, I, I, I am a prisoner of the Lord. He said, I am the prisoner. You know what that tells us? That tells us that Paul thought that if everybody else went south, if everybody else forgot about God, he was not going to. He was going to stand no matter what. Demas had forsaken him. Others had forsaken him, but Jesus didn't forsake him. God did not forsake him. Paul said, I am the prisoner of the Lord. Definite argument. No other Lord, no other God, no other thing, no, no, no Buddha, no Islam, none, none of that garbage. He said, I am the prisoner. Now, there's two aspects of being a prisoner. One, you've been taken captive. Paul had been taken captive by Jesus Christ. He wasn't captive by the Roman government. He was captive by Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people in the church that have been captive. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. But another is, you come in submission. He surrendered. There are a lot of people in the Lord's church who maybe have become captive to the Lord in a sense, but they never surrendered. How, how do I know that? <laughs> hey, I, I just look at it every Sunday. Every Sunday with people dragging in late. Every Sunday with people not being there. Every Sunday when we, we have the Lord's table spread and, and they walk away from that or they don't come or ball game's more important or something else is more important than that. Just one thing to be taken captive. It's another to surrender. They sing that song in church, I surrender all. I'll tell you what, if you had that split between two sides, how they used to do the song, you sing this verse, you sing the other, the I surrender some would be louder than the other one, just I, I surrender all. 
I surrender some all to Jesus. Wavy, I'll give. And I surrender some. Are you a prisoner of the Lord? Have, have you been taken captive? Have, have you surrendered? As I look at the brotherhood, we're in trouble. We're in deep, dark trouble because people haven't surrendered. Oh, they've been taken captive by something, but that is not the Lord Jesus Christ. I become a prisoner of the Lord. Amen? And he said, with all loneliness and meekness, forbearing one another in love, with long-suffering, We need to love one another, but in a love that, that's godly love, an agape love. We're not talking about this feel-good love. We're talking about a love that sticks with a brother or sister, that uplifts each other, that, that takes somebody to a newer height. Listen, it's not all about you. It's about somebody else. It's not about you. We, we got this idea that everything has got to be tuned to me. How I feel, how I do, how, how you taking care of me. Nobody shook my hand. All this garbage. I've seen so much pettiness in, in the Lord's church of somebody whining and crying around. I'd like to go and jack slap them in the next year. Oh, well, he shook my hand. Oh, he did not, he didn't talk to me today. Here it is, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and you're whining about somebody didn't shake your stinking hand. God help us. We need to grow up. Grow up. You know, we talk about the love chapter in the 13th chapter. That's not the love chapter. Well, everybody say, oh, yeah, love, love does everything, you know. No, what, what Paul's talking about there, he's saying to the Corinthian church, grow up. Grow up. Get a life. Sometimes in the church, I like to grab a hold of somebody. Why don't you get a life, huh? Would you please get a life? Please help me. I can't take it anymore. Grow up. Now, when we get to this third verse, fourth verse, third verse, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace, somehow that doesn't compute with a lot of churches and a lot, a lot of preachers. The only thing they see there is unity and peace. That's all they see. They don't see the spirit. They don't see whatever else he's trying to say there. Unity. They're trying to get along with everybody. God did not put us on this earth to get along with everybody. He came in there like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. When Jesus got, Jesus doesn't come to keep you out of the fire. He comes to get in the fire with you. They want unity and peace. You know, most of the elders in the Lord's church are called elders. Most of them aren't elders because they've never obeyed the terms of being an elder. Of course, we don't want to push that, you know. <laughs> who, who, would re who would really go out on a limb and push that? Come on. One elder told me one time, he said, well, I'm here to keep the peace. Was he Marshall Dillon or what? I don't know. Where's Festus? The Festus probably was his associate. You're not an elder to keep the peace. You're an elder to stand for the truth, shepherd the flock, do what you're thinking supposed to do. We've given up ground. I've got five areas where we've given up ground the Lord's church. 
We've given up ground in the public arena. We backed off of the public, uh, from the public. We, we're kind of getting in our corner because, uh, you know, we're all here and we all love each other and we all get over here. But listen, the world's out there. And we need to make a difference out there. So we've given up ground. And we can look at the world. God's not welcome in this world. God's not welcome in our school system. God's not welcome in our government. God not welcome anyone. In fact, whenever I hear abortion on demand, you know what I really hear? Crucify him. When I hear the homosexual agenda, what do I hear? I hear crucify him. We've given up ground. We need to get out there and preach like we used to preach. Stand for what we used to stand for. Make a difference where we used to make a difference. We're, we're more like a, a thermometer than a thermostat. We're not changing the direction of the world. We're letting the world change us. We've given up ground in the public ground. I remember going to a, a meeting when they were going to put the uh, gambling boats down in uh, Portsmouth, Ohio. Yeah, they, they were going to do there, and uh, I was fortunate that the uh, mayor had called and wanted me to come to the meeting, okay? So I went to the meeting and sat in there, and I heard all this stuff about whatever going, everything's going to do. They're going, all this money's going to come into Portsmouth. All this stuff is coming into Portsmouth. And so I raised, I raised my hand finally, and he says, I know what you're going to say. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're going to bring up the Bible. I said, no, I'm not going to bring up the Bible. He said, why are you going to bring up the Bible? I said, because you guys don't know any Bible. That's why I'm not going to bring up the Bible. Why would I bring up the Bible to you guys that ain't got a clue about what the Bible is? But I'll bring up something that you might get. He said, I said, you said they're going to come in here and shop at, shop at CVS. You're out of your stinking head. You think they're coming down here? To, they're going to buy goods from CVS. They're going to go to Kroger's. They're going to go to the stinking camping boat. That's where they're going. You're going to have more drugs, more prostitution, more crime. We got a two-lane road coming in there, and there's supposed to be a million people come to that to that gambling boat in a year. Can you imagine a, a town of 21,000? Two-lane road? But they're going to buy at Kroger. I should have told them they need to get their Kroger cards ready because they can sign them all up so when they get their gas, they can get it cheaper down here. You get a lie. we giving up ground. We're giving up the praying ground. What do our people pray for? Listen, I'm getting your face right here. I, I, I probably need to do that to pr prayer clean. But what do we pray for? Aunt Betsy's big toe. She heard it last night. She stubbed her toe. <laughs> well, what you pray for my Aunt Betsy? I have one in, <laughs> oh, man, praying. She said, my neighbor, my neighbor, uh, uh, Jasmine, they're going up to Columbus, Ohio, and uh, their car's not running right. I pray that they get there up there to Columbus, Ohio, and, and see their uncle's in the hospital. I, God, I pray that they don't have a flat tire. <laughs> God, 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 I pray they don't drop a valve in that car. The neighbor's going to hell. But make sure they make it to Columbus, Ohio. Make sure they don't have a flat tire. 
Make sure they don't drop a valve or a piston goes out of that car. They, had, they need a tow. Pray that they don't do that. But who cares whether they go to hell or not? Now, you know it, and I'm sitting in here, and I know it too, that 99% of the prayers are physical. How many pray that will win souls? How many pray that the church will go forward? How many pray that I'll win my neighbor? How many pray, help me, I'm going to go talk to somebody about Jesus? How many pray that? How many? You know what I'm talking about. If you was on one of them game shows, it'd be, eh, wrong answer. But pray they get to Columbus, Ohio. Her neighbor is going to hell. Her neighbor doesn't have the Lord. Listen, we need to start praying for things that really mean something. Lost souls, the world. America, our brothers and sisters, that they might have guts enough to finally go out and talk to somebody about Jesus. I just don't know what to say. Well, you've been in here 23 years, and that is a pitiful, absolute pitiful answer. You don't know what to say? After all the preaching, after all the teaching, you don't have a clue Brothers and sisters, you want to change the world, you need to start changing yourself. Start changing your mindset, looking for opportunities. I don't know, I don't know how to talk to somebody. Well, you can get on the phone until your brains fall out. We're giving up the praying ground. I have one guy that Judy sent me to Aldi's in the middle of the afternoon. She ought to be punished for it. She ought to repent. Back when Danny sings that song, I expect her to come forward. Along with the cheater over here in cards last night. Hallelujah. (laughs) So when I come out of there, and then I saw this woman that hadn't been going to church. I went up and started talking to her. She gave me a big hug and everything. And, and I said uh, about her husband, I said, uh, how's Steve doing? Oh, he's worried about his sugar. Said he's really in a fit about his sugar. I said, well, you, you going to church? Got to go. <laughs> What's your situation with the Lord? God, I'll see you later. She and he are more concerned about his sugar than hellfire. Brothers and sisters, we need to start praying. Praying for boldness, praying that we'll get out and preach and teach and talk to people and share the gospel of Christ. We've given up the praying ground. The third thing we gave up is the parental ground. Well, I'm going to let little Harry decide whether he wants to go to the assembly or not. That little sucker, you need to grab him by the nap of the neck and jerk his tail up. You know, in our household, you know how many of our kids decide whether they're going to church or not? Ain't a one of them, because I heard them. We've given up the parental ground, man. We, 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 the kids are, uh, the nuts are running the nut house. Kids are running the house anymore. You see it in the stores. We had a woman come over to our house, and, and I told this up in Reno, Nevada, when we preached there. And that kid was tap dancing on my furniture. And then temperature rising, you know. I feel, I, it was an Elvis song. I feel the temperature rising, you know. I was like this. Uh, uh. Now, Johnny, honey, now, John, Johnny, that sucker, you know. <laughs> yeah, now, Johnny, honey, honey, baby, all the way. But God had blessed 
because our bathroom was upstairs. And God put a quiver in her liver, and she had to go to the bathroom. It was like a miracle come true. She went to the bathroom, and Johnny was there, and I picked that dude up. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to break your face. I'm going to hurt you. You understand? You sit down and shut up. Now, you say that's terrible, but I felt good about it. (laughs) And she come back down, and that boy sat there quiet in the mouth. I look at him. Yeah. Anyway, we're getting ready to leave, and she says, Oh, Johnny, he's been a good boy, hadn't he? And I said, yeah, yeah, and I went to pat his head and he ducked. (laughs) That's a true story, man. We've given up the ground. Be parents. Well, well, when your kid gets up in the morning and he's, he's eight or nine years old, well, I've decided I ain't going to school today. Okay, honey, decide for yourself. How long that dog going to hunt, huh? With me, that dog ain't going to hunt. I'm going to tell you what, you're, you're going to go out of here, but you might have a boot in your patoot. But you're going to get on the school bus or whatever you're doing, you're going to go. Parents start being parents. People, kids are not coming to church because of the parents. And a lot of it is because the parent rather see the kid play Little League baseball and midget football than become a child of God. They rather see the kid play sports than go to heaven. Be a parent. Start being what God called you to be. Train up a child in a way he should go. That's your responsibility. You know what makes me mad? You know, I do like that one guy. You know what makes me sick? You know what makes me want to take a toothpick and pick my ear out? It's parents. Parents, yeah. There ain't nothing for the kids at church. It's not my responsibility. The church's responsibility to raise your kids is yours. It is your job. It is what you signed up for. It is what you had them for. It's what they're in your house. They're in your house how many hours a day? And you expect me in a half hour that you bring them in and they're messed up and they ain't ready for a church. They're not ready for anything. And I'm supposed to take care of their needs? You need to get a life. You need to grow up. We given up the public ground, we given up the praying ground, we given up the parental ground, we gave up the preaching ground. Most preaching today is a bunch of garbage. I mean they got Joe Olstein on speed dial. Getting the internet sermons, man, that's all it is, getting the internet sermons. And we don't want to preach on anything. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to step on anybody's toes because you know the tote board over here where the money's at and the attendance is at. That's, that's everything, see? No, that isn't everything. Everything is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's everything. Most times is you go to some preaching, it's like getting on a merry-go-round. You go around and music sounds good. Horse goes up and down there a few times. But when you get done, when you get off, it's the same place you got on. Nobody's changed. You haven't convicted anybody. You haven't brought anybody to the Lord. You haven't took them a step closer to Jesus Christ, step closer to the holy living, to to loving the Lord. Real gospel preaching is at a premium today. Most churches are not doing it. And I'll, I'll tell you, whether it ticks you off or not, you know what? 
I could care less. But if you go to Cincinnati Bible Cemetery and you go to KCC or whatever, KC, whatever, you get a guy out of there, he don't know Jack. He doesn't know anything. He don't know how to preach. He don't know where to stand. He don't know anything. They've watered down the gospel so much, it's worthless. When you send kids out to intern at the Methodist, when you send in kids to intern out to Episcopalian, when you send kids out to intern at the Presbyterian, what do you think you're going to get? When you don't give them values and this core example of the Word of God, stand on this. Most of the programs, that's why at Sunshine we don't have the garbage program because we ain't got time for that. You take out all the garbage programs that I had to go through to get the master's degree and the doctrinal degree, I'm telling you what, you took it all down to one, and that was Greek. That was the only thing that I got worth a lick anywhere. If you're, listen to me, if you're supporting them school, I'm not telling you to support us. I don't care whether you support us or not. We're going to make it no matter what. But if you're supporting them schools, your churches ought to think twice. Because liberal garbage is going on over there, unbelievable. It has been. It was over there when I was there, when I had to fight tooth and nail with them over the truth of the doctrine while I was sitting in their stinking class. And then I had other guys that, that spoke on the big programs in there with me, and they never said a word. And when I went to them, I said, why, why don't you open up your mouth? Well, I, 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 I just say, I, I spit out the bones and just take the meat. I said, that's what Jesus said, didn't it? Yeah, I said, that's somewhere, Matthew. I know it is. Some, it's in there somewhere, right? And then we went out to eat, and they come over to me, and I got up and walked over to another place. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there eating a burger cake. They come over and sat down with me, and I picked myself up and went someplace else. They said, what are you doing? I said, listen, if you don't want to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in the wrong company, man. We need men to stand, to preach, and preach the truth. The fifth thing we've given up is the doctrinal ground. They're having the Gideons come in. For God's sakes, man, got a false plan of salvation in there and everything else, but we're going to have them let it come into our pulpit. We're going to let them come into our pulpit. What? Some, somehow I missed it in Second John. Somehow I missed it. Somehow I missed it where it said, don't, don't give them the right hand of fellowship, Third John and that. Somehow I missed that. Oh, don't give them the right hand of fellowship, but let them come in here to preach. What is the matter with us? How about the singers? I'm telling you what, I was preaching a revival, and I think Bob was there. Bring in denomination singers. The guy got up there and got saved in a telephone booth. I asked him afterward, how'd they get all that water in that telephone booth? What do you mean, brother? Well, they seal it up. Is it like one of them magician acts, you know, where they seal it up and they're trying to get out in the last second or what? what what's happening here? We're not to wish them Godspeed. They're sending people to hell, and we are too, when we do not preach the truth. You better realize that. When you, before you preach or before you teach, you need to look in the mirror and say, hey, hey, big guy, what are you going to do today? 
How are you going to stand today when you see somebody over here who can't stand your guts? <laughs> it's just even in the congregation. Or somebody over here that's been giving you trouble or that. And you know this guy here don't believe anything. But hey, man, you don't want to ruffle his feathers because he gives the big time money. We need to stand. We need to stand on the public ground. We need to stand on the parental ground. We need to stand on the praying ground. We need to stand on the preaching ground. We need to stand on the doctrinal ground. We just need to stand. And I'm not giving up no ground. I've given up no ground to denominational people. I'm not giving up no ground to the heathens. I'm not giving up no ground to the homosexuals. I'm not giving any ground up to the abortionists. I'm not giving up no ground. No ground. I ain't giving up. No ground. Let's be standing. Grab your song sheets. Good song to sing. This is a good message in song. And I don't know how in the world you can have a message like what Brother Jim just uh, preached and not be able to, to gang up together and uh, sing a song like this. No ground. You all have the words, don't you? No Sing the same song. 